It's been a little over a week since I first unboxed and started using the M2 MacBook Air, and I know this is not the first review you've seen. Obviously, lots of channels have checked it out, put it to its tests. You've seen Geekbench tests and Cinebench scores and all that, so I'm not going to waste your time going over all of the same results. We're going to put it through the Telos of Tech benchmark of trying to get it to work through my workflow of live streaming, video editing, podcast recording, and of course, exporting multiple 4K at 60 videos within a single day. And I must say this was an interesting one. This was kind of a different laptop to check out compared to all of the other Apple Silicon laptops because it's not so easy machine to recommend as was the previous Apple Silicon laptops that had this huge jump from Intel. Now it's getting a bit more complicated. Let's begin. So, because I think most people checking out the MacBook Air aren't professionals that are editing 8K Canon RAW videos every single day, I don't want to start off with performance. I want to kick off the review with just talking about this design. Mostly because it's a different approach to the MacBook Air, which we haven't seen. You know, they haven't redesigned it since 2018, so this is kind of a rare thing for the lineup. And it does look awfully pretty. I admire how close it resembles the MacBook Pro chassis, but of course just slims down on it a little bit. Bit. You don't have enough thickness to engrave the name MacBook Air on the bottom, and honestly, there's no uh, MacBook Air writing or branding of any kind on this machine. That's all baked into the software. Kind of makes you wonder if this was more of a prototype for the regular MacBook to come back, and maybe at the last minute they decided Air was just too iconic to ditch. But a lot of people were concerned about midnight. You know, I think that it's caused a bit of placebo effect. A lot of channels highlighting the fact that it has fingerprints and oils and smudges collect on midnight midnight pretty obviously. And I will admit compared to my Space Gray MacBook Pro, it is a tad more noticeable, but again, that might just be because so many people are asking about it and bringing attention to it. The truth is I think any MacBook can get dirty and can collect a lot of oils, fingerprints, and smudges. My MacBook Pro gets a heck of a lot of use every day, so I notice all of the oils and stuff and it probably should try harder to clean it, but the Midnight MacBook Air is of course no exception, but the oils and smudges only are really noticeable when I shine it in certain lighting. What actually is far more noticeable to me is the dust and little particulates that show off on this very, very dark design. Starts to make you understand why Apple might not want to design matte black MacBooks, even though that's what we all want. All of that dust just glistens on that finish, and from what I've heard from Apple Store employees that are, you know, demoing the new MacBook Air in front of everybody who's checking it out with all of their McDonald's fingers. Yeah, they've said that they have to clean it pretty frequently. So yeah, midnight a little bit dirty, but I don't think the end of the world or a reason to not buy the product. Luckily, I haven't had too many scratches along the ports, although I've seen people who have been a bit more abusive towards the ports and shown paint scratching over time when, you know, you're drunk and trying to plug in a USB-C port or you're trying to utilize MagSafe for its intended feature, which is just to kind of hold the cable in the general proximity and then it plugs in. Yeah, that kind of makes me paranoid that I'm gonna scratch my paint, but I haven't. I've been babying this thing. And it's always impressive to me to find a laptop that can work and operate pretty efficiently without any fans. I haven't used the MacBook Air since the end of 2020, and that one very much impressed me with how much it could get done and still not make a single sound. There's no moving parts in here at all. It's a little bit helpful, especially when I'm doing live streaming or something and you don't want the fans kicking on and the microphones picking that up. This, you won't have to worry about. With my MacBook Pro, eh, it's happened occasionally. Usually it's pretty efficient, but if I'm doing something power intensive, those fans start to kick in and the audience can't hear them through the microphone. So a little bit of an advantage here, but it's fun to see the epitome of what MacBook design could get to when you're designing a Mac with Apple Silicon from the ground up, you know? So they put the M1 chip in the MacBook Air, but that was basically the same chassis and design from 2018. There was a lot of internal improvements, not so much external, but now we're getting to see how Apple designed designs these MacBooks when they know for a fact this chassis will never have to accommodate for an Intel processor. But as far as portability goes, which is supposed to be what the MacBook Air is all about, I don't particularly find it, you know, like unbelievably light or insanely thin. I knew it'd be thinner and lighter, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit underwhelmed by, you know, it's still got a decent amount of weight to it. It's not like when I picked up an uh, iPad out of a box or something. When I picked this out of the box, I was like, yeah, okay, this 2.7 pounds, I guess. That's to be expected. 
expected there's some weight, but I think what's kind of stolen a lot of MacBook Air Thunder is still that 12-inch MacBook that Apple discontinued so many years ago, because that was still thinner, at least in width. You know, that's a laptop I could actually type on with just my thumbs. This isn't quite thin enough to do that, but it was absolutely lighter back then, and I kind of wish Apple would have just kept the wedge design, but gone with something even thinner and lighter than the M1 MacBook Air, even thinner and lighter than this, and just have a thin bezeled version of the 12-inch MacBook. That, I think, had a lot more of a wow factor in terms of portability and lightweight design. When I reviewed that MacBook last, I was showcasing how I can actually hold that MacBook with one hand and type on it with the other and just hold it while I'm laying down for hours. Can't really do that with this. It still kind of feels like a bit of a brick, and, you know, we had the wedge design for years. It was iconic and honestly starting to get a little bit boring, but I don't think it was the wedge itself that people were tired of. I think the whole reason that 12-inch MacBook just didn't do so well was because the keyboard was unreliable and the performance of Intel in a fanless design like that just didn't go so well. Now we have Apple Silicon, and I think that probably would have been a much more jaw-dropping portability factor, whereas this, you know, it's, it's good, but if you compare it to the M1 MacBook Air, it's not, you know, like leaps and bounds lighter and thinner or anything. But Apple is kind of bumping up against the laws of physics a little bit. Batteries can only get so small, chips can only get so efficient, and frankly, I think a lot of you know how the M2 chip performs when it comes to the base model, 256 gig variants. There's actually some compromises with the read and write speed that make it a little bit worse. And other channels have figured out that the 10 core GPU is more prone to thermal throttling and can often perform worse than the binned 8 core GPU option, which feels completely backwards, but it shows to me that there's a bit of a disconnect between the Apple Silicon team developing the chip and the chassis team developing the hardware, which is a shame because you would think Apple can have a collaboration between these two teams, so you don't have to worry so much about thermal throttling. But yeah, that is a genuine concern here. In fact, I was using it today to record the Taylor of Tech and EV podcasts, but we started with the EV one, and it struggled to just maintain a video call and record with OBS simultaneously. At first it was fine, and then I got that encoding overloaded warning message, and I tried to tinker with the settings to get that message to go away, but by the end of the show I hit stop recording, and it just kind of froze up, and the file corrupted. I wasn't able to retain my recording of the EV show, so we sat there and talked through the whole thing. And you know, it was reading my volume, and the guys could see me on the Discord call, but just the CPU struggled to write a simple video file and maintain a video call at the same time. That was too much for it, and we lost the whole podcast just because of the M2 chip and it not being able to manage heat all that well. Another issue that I bumped into that the channel members can attest is something I've started doing ever since I got my M1 Max MacBook Pro is live streaming the behind the scenes filming and editing process of these videos. And I tried to do that on the MacBook Air and you know when it's just streaming from the webcam and the onboard mic and everything, it's fine. But once I started trying to capture my display, which is only running at 60 Hertz, right? It's not 120 Hertz and it's a lower resolution than my MacBook Pro. So this is not as power intensive a task, it got really, really choppy. And no matter how much CPU usage I let OBS take, it still was really, really jittery. And it got to the point of unwatchable. It was like one frame every 15 seconds. So there's another thing I kind of do on the regular for my channel that the M2 chip got too hot with and wasn't able to keep up with. Now, I understand those types of use cases are not common. In fact, most people buying the MacBook Air are not video editors or live streamers and that kind of thing. So the things I will give it credit for for are the improved webcam quality, which is great. It's 1080p and the onboard microphone sounds really, really good. It's the same mic they use in the new MacBook Pros. Even in rooms where it's pretty echoey, it's able to isolate your voice and capture it fairly effectively. I'm glad to see that come down to a cheaper model and that's more accessible. But the question still remains now that Apple is still selling the M1 MacBook Air at full price, but with certified refurbished, you can actually find it for under $900 in a lot of places. It's making me wonder like, okay, for an extra 200 or occasionally $300 more, is that better webcam and MagSafe and this new design, slightly bigger display, better microphones, and all that. Slightly better speakers, is that worth the additional money? Of course, that answer is gonna all come down to you. There's not a one-size-fits-all for everyone, but I think the main reason I have a difficult time recommending this machine to everyone is if you're on a budget, it's really not that great a deal because if you're buying the base model, it's arguably worse than the base model MacBook Air in read and write speeds, which can potentially affect your day-to-day -day usage if you're running lots of tabs or running lots of applications at the same time and you're limited in virtual memory swap. So if you're just ultimately 
ultimately trying to find the best value Mac possible, I still think a certified refurbished M1 MacBook Air is just impossible to beat. And because of all the thermal throttling with the M2 chip, I feel like performance is not necessarily a reason to opt for the M2. I mean, it's built on the same architecture. It seems to suffer from a lot more thermal throttling than the M1 did. And even in the instances where it is faster than the M1, it's usually not by a long margin or a huge shot. One scenario that I ran into that I just wanted to admit, yeah, okay, I noticed the M2 chip being quite a bit faster, is that new ProRes video encoder that wasn't accommodated with the M1 chip, but now they've baked that into the M2. So of course, Talos of Tech has to do his Final Cut video export tests. Last time I reviewed the M1 MacBook Air, I was comparing it to my iMac Pro with Final Cut, with ProRes footage, exporting a 4K at 60 video that was five minutes long in the timeline with cuts and edits and stuff because 4K is the best resolution, 8K is overkill, and 60 frames a second is the best frame rate. That's right, Marquez. And back then, the iMac Pro finished the export in about 12 minutes and the M1 MacBook Air finished it in about 15. So it was a little bit slower, but I am happy to admit that with the M2 chip in the MacBook Air, I did the same test with my MacBook Pro. And of course, the M1 Max chip beat it out. I don't think that surprises anyone, but the five minute export was done in just a little over three minutes, which is pretty dang fast. That's what I loved about the M1 Max chip so much. It could export content faster than you could watch it. M2 can't exactly stay the same, but it did finish that export in just a little over six minutes. So that's where I start to see some of the video transcoding performance gains Apple talked about, where they mentioned the M2 chip being like three times faster at video transcoding than the M1. Yeah, it's not an exact science. It's not apples to apples because we have different versions of Final Cut and different footage and all that. But still, the fact that the old M1 MacBook Air took 15 minutes to export a video and this took a little over six, that's quite a reduction in export times. You know, obviously it's not as fast as an M1 Pro or M1 Max chip is going to be, but the fact that now there's a fanless MacBook out there that is able to outperform, at least in exporting tests, my iMac Pro from five years ago that started at $6,000 and, you know, this starts at $1,200, that's a pretty impressive milestone, but that's pretty much one of the only positive tests I've ever seen the M2 perform in. Everything else seems to struggle a lot with thermal throttling, and ultimately, I think that the people buying a MacBook Air are not too concerned with export times. If you're really, you know, using your laptop for your business and you're trying to get export times down as low as you can because time is money and that's important to you, you probably should be opting for a MacBook Pro anyway. This is for people that don't need that kind of insane speed. But again, that's where I struggle with the recommendation is it's like, it's not winning on affordability. It's not winning on performance. And in terms of design, you know, I could see some people out there raving about it and loving this look and being really in love with this clean, more modular look and, you know, just the flat edges and the curved bottom. Some people may really like that and having a notch with thinner bezels around the edges, that's kind of modern and new looking, of course, but that's really all I can recommend it for. If you're trying to be cost conscious, then it's not the cheapest MacBook you can get. And no, I don't think the M1 MacBook Air is so much substantially worse than this, then it's not worth considering. And at the same time, if you start specking out an M2 MacBook Air, you very quickly start to get to the same price of the 14 inch MacBook Pro, which honestly may be a very tricky ploy on Apple's end to just say, let's, you know, get the MacBook Air really close to the price of a MacBook Pro so that people feel like, eh, they only got to spend a little bit more. It's only a hundred bucks more. It's only 200 bucks more, or depending on which spec you get, like, eh, it's only 300 bucks more to get a machine with, you know, better ports, better display, better speakers. By the way, the low frequencies that the new MacBook Pros can get are insanely good. I was a little bit disappointed with the speaker quality of the MacBook Air, but I think it's just because I've been spoiled with the insane audio quality of the MacBook Pro. I'll try to give you a side-by-side -side comparison, which is hard to hear over video, of course, because you're all listening on different speakers, but I think that the speaker quality is different enough that even my microphone will be able to pick it up. So just listen.
And of course, I'm a diehard sucker for 120 hertz. I don't care too much about the mini LED, but if you care about extreme dynamic range, the MacBook Pros are rocking that. Even the Bind M1 Pro chip is gonna perform much better than the M2 because it's got an actual fan to keep it cool and it has much more high performance cores than this one does. And the battery life is frankly still really good on the 14 inch MacBook Pro and I've checked them out in the Apple store. I don't find it insanely heavier or thicker than this design. So I feel like I could lean more on the portability argument if Apple did something a lot more like the 12 inch MacBook, but they didn't. And because of this form factor still weighing, you know, a decent amount and it's not insanely more portable than the 14 inch MacBook Pro. That makes me feel like, yeah, if you're starting to spec out one of these things to higher than like $1,600 or $1,500, you should probably just save a little bit more and opt for a certified refurbished 14 inch MacBook Pro. That comes with 512 gigs of storage and 16 gigs of RAM, which if you spec for that trim with this MacBook Air, which a lot of you will because of all the read and write speeds concerns with the 256 gig NAND. So the base model is often performing worse than the old M1 MacBook Air. Maybe that's the thing. Apple wants all of us reviewers and everyone in the community to just say, get the 14 inch MacBook Pro. It's so much better. At the end of the day, Apple still wins when we all advocate for that because we can all get a bunch of MacBook buyers out there justifying spending a little bit more on their MacBooks because they're thinking, oh, I'm so close to a Pro anyway. If I'm so close to having a much better machine, I should just get the better machine. But in the end, Apple still wins because you spent $2,000 on your laptop. So it's a tricky little machine to find a market for, but I do still admire the design. And in terms of video export tests, it's cool to see a fanless chip perform faster than my iMac Pro. That's just kind of mind boggling. And no, I still don't recommend the M2 MacBook Pro, mostly because of the price. If you could get that dated 13 inch MacBook for $1,000, it would be a different story. But for $1,300 and they're skimping out on the NANs on those things. So the read and write speed isn't that great on the base model. So you got to upgrade it to 512 to get the better speeds. You're so close to a 14 inch MacBook Pro at that point anyway. That yeah, of all the MacBooks I've tried in the past couple of years, this has been the trickiest one for me to find an audience for. It's not like an easy recommendation for a wide demographic. It's just like, do you like cool new modern MacBook designs? If you do, I guess this one is the one to go with, but if you're trying to be affordable, no, don't get this one. If you're trying to get something with good performance, no, also don't get this one. So it's just kind of a result of a fairly complicated Mac lineup, but options are good. And it's probably worth mentioning that yes, this thing has some thermal throttling and people are gonna complain about the speed in it, but people have been complaining about the speed in the performance of the MacBook Air basically since Steve Jobs introduced it. Ever since then, people have saying, yeah, this isn't very fast and this isn't very high performing and yet it has become Apple's best-selling notebook. The MacBook Air outsells every other Mac. So maybe we shouldn't write off aesthetics and clean new modern design so much because Apple has kind of proven that a lot of the time their best-selling Mac is the one that people find the prettiest for the lowest price. You know, maybe people like having a cool modern looking laptop and maybe looks are part of the reason a lot of people go with Macs in the first place. It's easy to forget that when we get all hyped up in M2 chip performance and it's easy to get sidetracked and realize, no, that MacBook Air from the beginning was all built around how cool it looked. It wasn't about how cool it ran. Maybe that doesn't mean as much anymore now that we have MacBook Pros that are still pretty thin, pretty light, and very high performing. But yeah, because it failed to even record my podcast reliably and I can't live stream myself video editing with this thing because it overheats way too fast, there's no point in me keeping it around, so I won't be holding on to this one and I'm very much looking forward to going back to editing off my 16-inch MacBook Pro because 120 hertz solid and I prefer the bigger display. I prefer the bigger trackpad and basically everything about my MacBook Pro is better. So no surprise there. But if there's any of you out there still rocking your M2 MacBook Air, I do hope you genuinely enjoy it. I don't want you to feel buyer's remorse or regret. You know, there's a lot of things to appreciate here and I do think it will get software updates for years and years to come. And I hope that the thermal throttling doesn't impact you too much. And if you buy the base model, I still think it will work well for you. There's too many people assuming that read and write speed is gonna be a big difference on machine that only have 256 gigs of storage. It's like, if you buy a 256 gig MacBook, you probably aren't moving that many files. So read and write speed is going to mean the difference of a couple of seconds when transferring large files. So I don't think that's as big a deal as people were making it out to be. But either way, I hope there's an audience that is passionate about this new design and can appreciate it. And I appreciate you all for sticking around for this lengthy review. Thank you all for watching. This is your Alpha Sheep here, and I'll see you all in the next one.